Welcome! With us, you're not just a listener, you're part of the community. The movement driving real progress. Let's explore how big ideas can turn into real-world positive impacts together. My name is Ronnie Eriksson and this is the Impact Series. Rich here. You're the founder of multiple ventures, including Langor, an advertising agency of creative technologists across Asia, India, Singapore, Hong Kong and Australia. These days you're running Distributed Energy, a solar platform for energy emerging markets, making solar power more, more affordable and accessible. As an impact investor, you're dedicated to supporting startups that aim to create significant social and environmental benefits. Your inv investment philosophy centers around the belief that technology and business can be powerful tools for positive impact. And you work to ensure that your investments align with these values. And on top of that, uh, you're also a fellow podcaster. Super excited to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Each of these episodes uh, here uh, at Catapult Future Fest are aligned with it, its team. And they start with a what if question. So I'm going to throw you now in the deep end. So the question goes, what if more of us would see technology and business as a tool for positive impact instead of financial gain? What if you would see technology, more of us would see technology and business as something for higher impact rather than for financial gain? You know, um, the part of the world I grew up in and I come from... Um, what is that? Uh, India. Uh, I actually deeply believe that the only way India or the global south can catch up is by deeply investing in technology. Mm. I think the whatever the history and whatever the challenges that have brought us to this date, it is going to be extremely difficult to replicate the growth path or pattern of the West in the global south. It's not going to be the same. And the only leap is going to come from investing in technology for people. And so I think that this is not an option for people in the global south. I think what you asked the what if, it's a must because the only path uh, the global south has, India has, for, is, the, is the path forward. It's not the choice of how they grow. It's the choice that they, it's the focus that they have to adopt technology. So one of the examples is how India now has one of the highest volume uh, payment transactions in the world. Um, and that is not a private investment. That was a public initiative. The public, uh, the government, um, design policy and infrastructure to enable peer-to-peer -peer transactions um, through both banking and mobile phones. And now, if you visit India, out on your day-to-day -day basis, there's almost no cash transactions. Almost all of the cash transactions are in big things like real estate where there's possible tax avoidance. So the government has brought in so, many, so much of the monetary system and brought in so many of the people, and that's by investing in technology. So I think that is the only way forward. I don't think that's a what if in my mind, especially for the global south. If we want to elevate billions of people in terms of their lifestyle, technology is the only way. Can't more than agree. I've uh, been working a lot, uh, global south, Africa, uh, seeing exactly the same thing. You have a lot of young hungry people, also slightly older uh, hungry people. Everyone is hungry to succeed, to get the same opportunities, to actually put their talent into work. Uh, of course, like those tools and ecosystems, networks are not yet there. Uh, something that we've been uh, in many ways trying to bridge, but because of the histories and because how the uh, reality is, it hasn't been that easy. It takes time. Uh, but what has happened a lot in the Western world and what you see a lot happening now in, in the Western countries is that we use that technology and that business acumen to make more money and it's really individualistic as well. Uh, 
while we should actually be focusing on where we can actually do an impact and how we can collaborate with those places where there is a lot of this talent. So maybe uh, the what if is then targeted from your point of view here. So what if we uh, would actually be uh, focusing on the positive impact instead? How, how could we do that better? What, what, what would we need? I think the sad reality of the system we live in is the economics are extremely important because ultimately institutional capital, which is where the big money is, enables scale. The, the day-to-day I live is financing solar in emerging markets. And the impact of it is incredible. A few months ago, I was climbing the stairs of this large factory that produces car parts in India. It's an extremely large consumer of electricity and as a result, an extremely large emitter because a big chunk of that electricity is from coal. And we're now about to switch them over to solar. That means a big amount of emissions is going to be reduced, not all of it because there's some more uh, consumption, there's increase in consumption and so on, but a big chunk is about to be reduced. And that is only possible because now us and our investors have to invest in that plant, generate a return from the plant so that that factory can reduce its emissions. So the challenge in the system the humans have built the capitalistic system the humans have built, it's very hard to drive impact without the economics. At least at scale, it's easier to do it, say, on a smaller, um, in a smaller environment. But if you want to have large impact, the economics have to work. So, so, so as much as in my heart, I agree with you, uh, in my brain, it is not possible, or at least not today. And there's a long way to go for us to get there. Yeah, that's why it's a good what if question and <laughs> something that we aim for in the future. Uh, you seem to know this segment pretty well. You have really good points and really good insights. Uh, you come from the uh, agency world. Uh, could you like just in a couple of short steps say that how did you end up from that world to this world? I get that question often. I think um, I see myself um, as a as an organization builder, as a recruiter. I'm a really good, I'm really good at validating business ideas. I haven't meaningfully, when I say meaningfully, like in tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars, scaled a business yet. So, so um, this is the first time I'm experimenting that where we're now starting to scale in the tens of millions of dollars. The agency world was really attractive to me when we were trying to automate and invest in technology. But for a range of reasons, the advertising and the media revenue, given the volume it brought in, took over my mind share in terms of delivery versus investing in automation and technology. And so when that switch happened, I lost a lot of interest. We still grew 5x in three years and there was a lot of Um, learnings, but ultimately, um, I am a, I'm someone who really cares about the underlying impact, and the agency is about helping other people make money. So, so that was a missing piece for a while, and there was a time in the business where it made sense for me to exit. So we started the exit process, and so on. When I was exiting, I met my my business partner Matthew who also used to run a large energy business, and he sold that to KKR. So he was talking to me about what next. And one of the pieces was around investing in solar assets on the rooftop in emerging markets. Um, What we realized was the economics makes sense, but because of the way that whole space is designed, most people were investing in people rather than investing in technology. So when I have a salesperson who is being paid, say, $60,000 $60,000 a year in India, I want to do 10 megawatt solar plants, 20 megawatt solar plants, not 50 kilowatt solar plants. And renewable energy, this is the lesser known fact, over the period of time is cheap, but upfront is very expensive. It has an equity problem. Um, only the rich can afford it. So the SME, small and medium businesses in emerging markets, they were being left behind. So we realized that the place we wanted to zoom in on was the small and medium business segment where we help 
transition them to renewables, to clean energy. Um, so our average plant size is 100, uh, 250 kilowatts. That translates to roughly about $125,000, um, which for most investors in renewables is an extremely small ticket size. So it's a really difficult problem to solve because also a lot of the investors in this space don't want to invest in the markets we are in. But if if we have to transition, if we have to um, adapt to the new reality of climate change, there is no choice. These are the engine rooms of the economies we operate in, the SMEs. And 90% of the energy consumers in these markets often are these businesses. We have to transition them. So we decided we wanted to zoom in on that problem. And that's how we we transition to the solar financing business that we now do. So we're, we're now in nine countries. Um, we've, our portfolio is a little over 20 megawatts, roughly 13 million in AUM. And uh, we're starting to finally talk to institutional investors, talking about coming into this space because we are starting to show them a track record that this space is fundable and that they can actually make good economics which in turn allows us to actually invest in these uh, businesses, help them transition to clean energy. Yeah. It's actually really interesting because in one of the uh, other conversations uh, we've been having, having throughout this uh, a podcast we tapped into how actually these uh, uh, ultra wealthy individuals how they see investing in impact and uh, now you're working actually exactly in that segment where the societal structure uh, maybe the way people also think and act has not uh, evolved far enough so that we could actually get this project with with the high impact margin to operate while then this other podcast uh, and our guest was bringing out that They they actually are interested, so it might also be that you're just not finding each other. Is that why you're here at uh, Catapult Future? It, it, it is one of the reasons. I mean, I've been so deep in uh, uh, making the deals happen and proving the track record that I haven't spent as much time in building relationships, uh, primarily in the West, which is where so much of the impact capital is, um, talking about what we do. So this is now part of that journey where now every year I have to show up at three or four conferences so people can start tracking our progress and want to stay get involved. So for sure, that is part of it. But the other part of it is um, everybody, all investors have some form of a thesis of what they want to invest in. And folks who feel comfortable with equity investing in emerging markets in our spaces There's not that many people there. So there is an incredible amount of education required to help people bring on, uh, bring people on the journey. At the end of the day, everyone wants to make money with no risk. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's, oh, that, and so helping people understand the kind of risk they're getting, taking the kind of returns they're generating and the kind of impact they're having, it is my responsibility for sure. And I have to help them go through that journey. And so some of these investors will take time and we have to, we, it is our responsibility. I see myself as a translator. It is my responsibility to help them understand. So how do we do it? Because I, I know that I had the same issue with our Ambitious Africa project back in the days, uh, was that uh, we saw a lot of good opportunities, a lot of good projects, a lot of good startups. Then uh, cases that the normal, if we would have been a Finnish case or a Norwegian case, uh, everyone would have been like, I I'm interested, I want to meet with them, I'll do the investment. And just because the location of this company was, say, Rwanda or, or Kenya or wherever in India, they don't even want to like look at it. Mm -hmm. So how do we change that? There is no easy answer. Actually, I think of it as the entrepreneurial hustle. You keep doing a little bit constantly and you keep adding money as you get it. I think there are some people who are ambitious and who are like, I'm going to raise ten million dollars for this. And then you're setting your, yourself up for failure because you haven't got enough of a track record to show the outcome. So when you get the two hundred thousand dollars, you take it and then you show them the progress you made with that money so that then they will sign a bigger check and you keep doing it and you keep Uh, chipping away at the problem. Ultimately, people want 
track record and people want to experience being on the journey. There's this famous Soros quote that says, invest and investigate. And I think there are people with that mind out, mindset out there where they'll come in with small amounts because they want to know more. You accept that and you take them on the journey and some of them will keep coming back. We get that now. But it's taken a lot of education, a lot of time, a lot of energy to get these people keep coming back to invest in the space we are in. Um, the other problem also I find in the space is the institutional investors want scale and track record with data. So you have to be sophisticated enough to package both those things appropriately. And some of that requires you to skill up, as in we have to do the work to understand how to present information to them in a way that is attractive to them. So a big part of the journey is making it easy for them to digest all of the information we provide them and for them to feel comfortable that these guys know what they're doing. Let's go in with them. Um, we are only now starting to see the scale or talk to people that want, that can deploy capital at scale. Um, because my average check size is $125,000. So, and some of these folks want to start at $10 million. So we're now, because we have now deployed more than $10 million, People are, people are starting to believe that we can deploy money at that scale. That's super, super interesting. And it, it's like, it, it, it's fun to see how like this whole, uh, like say energy sector, but all of these like Im impact sectors that actually have a huge impact. Uh, they have a pretty interesting like financial gain model. Uh, they operate and they work on the like larger extent also of how to uh, bring together the uh, system, uh, the whole ecosystem, but also the like uh, societal change. So we can like move the needle and we can actually allow these new entrepreneurs to enter the space. It's pretty uh, courageous from you, like looking at the coming from the agency world and then jumping into like this uh, high ticket segment where you have a lot of like hardware and infrastructure as well involved. What have been the like biggest learnings what, what what has like allowed you to actually thrive in this different of a space <laughs> i think i'm still learning i think it's going to take a lot of learning to continue in this space i think the number one thing is uh, resilience and patience just being able to hang in there while the world around you keeps changing um so much of our work has been to make sure that we are operating sustainably and profitably. And, and I did not believe that that was a strength until I started looking at the other players in our space who were burning money substantially. What I realized through that experience is the problem is market environments can change relatively fast. And if you do not, if you're not sustainable or profitable, your ability to raise changes. And obviously there have been dramatic changes in the last few years. So because we are profitable, our ability to last while others fall has been an incredible strength. Um, the other part is also adapting. I think even though we only do solar finance, given the different markets we are in, contract structures, enforcements, how we think about references, underwriting risk, all of that is adapted to local markets. And so I may be an expert in solar finance, but even now I'm constantly learning when we look at new opportunities about the hidden problems in those situations. I think meaningfully, we will never be at a place where we know this space 100%. So we have to have the mindset that we have to adapt and we have to accept that there is only so much we can plan for. There is a certain amount of risk that will always exist. The last comment I'll make is... Um, one of the things we are currently toying with is um, writing off 5% of our revenue every month. 
because we invest, we are investors. We don't want to be in a situation where an asset, a customer stops paying for an asset. And that has a big impact on us. So instead of waiting for that to happen, it's inevitable that some part of our portfolio will default. We want to start doing that now so that at least we have some sort of a self-insurance pool on top of all the insurances we take that builds a layer, layer of comfort for us in case a customer defaults and we have to move the plant. We already had some money on the side that we take and uh, use to move that solar plant. So, so just in terms of learnings, like, I mean, I, that was an example of something that we are thinking of now after being in the business for four and a half years. So we're still like thinking of new ways to make this, continue to keep this attractive and make this a viable asset class. Um, I, 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 I often think that if we fail, the, the sector will suffer. And so I take that responsibility very seriously that I think we really have to do a good job at this or in some of these countries for sure the SME transition will take a giant backseat and that would not be great at least in some of those countries. I agree and if you think about the whole is then startup or investor or entrepreneur process of life it's When you stop learning, then you will stop growing. Uh, you will start slowly uh, dying. And one of the purposes in life is also like the continuous learning. So you are doing the right job if you keep on learning and there is always something new to learn. So that means that you're also evolving. So beautiful to hear. But beautiful to hear that there has been like some really concrete learnings also on the way because I think also on the educational aspect, that's what both the cases, but then also similar players as, as uh, you really need uh, to be able to thrive. And I think this whole Catapult Future Fest is a really great platform to also distribute those learnings, learn from other, learn from others, and understand both both sides, both of the like impact investors, the impact startups, and then how the players all around the world are operating. H have you been here before? No, my first time. First time. Have you been to Oslo? No, it's wonderful. Yeah. I guess this is the only month I could ever visit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. think I can do cold weather, but it's been wonderful yeah. so far. I've been. But then again, like looking at the uh, segment where you operate and work in it, like energy and winter is also a really, really interesting like combination uh, because it changes the whole, like makes the whole process the like dynamic. pretty opposite. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most parts of the world we are in, like the sun is very kind. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, it's most of the weather is predictable and you can uh, design for like solar assets. I mean, I can't imagine that that's true in Scandinavia. It must be a difficult thing to generate a, a, a short term return on solar. Yeah, we have our attempts, uh, some are succeeding, uh, but it needs to be compensated with some other things and they need to be pretty huge right. to, uh, for it to work out. But uh, we're trying. Uh, but I think here, again, the benefit is that here you have capital, you have some certain type of like technological expertise that is not found in other places. So again, it goes back to that we should collaborate more. We should actually work together. Uh, we should find each other at platforms like this because that's where the real change happens is that you're not working on your thing and your portfolio. We don't work on ours, but we actually work on together on the bigger picture. Uh, There's definitely a lot to be said about kind souls helping each other along the way. Um, a friend of mine gave me a book called um, Go Giver mm -hmm. and uh, I read it and I realized that was me. Like I enjoy just connecting the dots all the time and turns out that is why in some ways the universe has been so kind to me because um, yeah, I, I don't think twice about giving and in return um, so many times uh, things have just worked out. So yeah, like places like this, platforms like this, talking to people like you. Yeah, it's an it's an incredible privilege. Yeah, and I think that ties together also a lot of the things that we've uh, been going through is like, uh, 
a giving. So you actually give people other opportunities, you give people learning, so you get to actually to learn and you keep on doing that continuously. Uh, and the more different uh, the kind of like audience or the case or the thing you're building or the investor is that you're operating with or the case you're investing in is, the more uh, interesting, but also safe, uh, the whole like uh, thing becomes that you're really putting together. As the theme uh, has been what if, and we are uh, running towards the end of, of this episode, do you have like a what if question? Did you submit something that like that in here to KFF or do you have something that maybe pops up in your mind? I think a lot about energy abundance, um, especially because I'm so close to it right now. And so I often wonder what if aliens are real and what would their energy ecosystem look like and how far do we have to go for that kind of energy abundance so that people in Somaliland, which is where I was four weeks ago, do not have to pay 80 cents a unit for diesel generated power. Yeah, like <laughs> I think so much of the, so much of people's lives would just be so much better if we had cheaper and better energy. So I think a lot about that. Yeah. Um, and the beauty in life is that, uh, or one of the big realizations maybe in life is that everything in life is energy because energy equals work. And uh, everything you do is it lift your hand or talk to the mic or put the lights on or make the world a better place requires work and it requires energy. So uh, hopefully the aliens will come here one day and bring us the better solutions yeah. or we can at least go and learn from them. We can copy their tech. You know, I, I like, for example, and here's a, sorry, a little bit of a tangent. If you think about AI right now, the quality of outcomes from AI is incre incredibly inferior to our brains, but the amount of energy AI needs is like 100x to what we need mm. to operate those level of outcomes. And I, if we could divert just a little bit about, of that energy, towards people, because AI is actually going to bring more than employment for some of these people. Imagine all of the customer support centers that are just about to go out of business, and we're going to fund that with energy, not for the people who are about to lose their jobs, but for AI to help them lose their jobs. I think I'm an extremely optimistic person, but oh boy, the inequities in the world are insane, and we have so much work to do. Yeah. So hopefully the aliens can fix that as well. We <laughs> <laughs> the aliens on this planet yeah. now. <laughs> no, but I agree with your point. Uh, we also get super excited about the hype things always around us and forget to look what's under the hood. Mm. So uh, there we go really often wrong. And with kind of like your type of thinking, uh, with your kind of approach, I think we will actually overcome those. So it's about waking up, it's about educating, and it's about working on things that actually have a larger impact. That's been something I'm super happy to have like learned and be inspired here today. And also super thankful that you actually joined us here. Ronnie, it was a wonderful conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.